Your song is the ultimate happy clappy church. It sells rapture and joy along with Jesus. But there was always a nasty secret at its very core. A secret that when exposed would rock this Christian community and almost destroy Brian Houston. October 1999 was the fateful day where I was having a meeting in my office with one of my colleagues and he went on to tell me that someone had rung into our church office and had made a complaint that 30 years before my father had abused a, a boy. First I'm thinking, that, that's immoral. And then within a split second I'm thinking, that's criminal. And, uh, you know, I, I was just stunned, st shattered. The day that Brian found out about his dad, he took me for lunch in the city and uh, he sat there and he said, I've got something terrible to tell you. My heart sunk. My heart sunk for a minute because I thought, oh my God, he's going to tell me he's had an affair. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh. And then he said, I mean, not that that's laughable, but he, um, he said, um, and he, he told me, I don't even remember his words. And I, I just remember, I, I was stunned. I was stunned. I remember my dad talking to us obviously about you know, my grandfather who at that time really was a hero to me and I'm finding out the most horrific stuff ever and I, I immediately was like maybe I should change my, my last name you know because I'm thinking for the rest of my life that's gonna be around. The dad that I knew right up to really his dying day was a totally different person than what now the world knows was an evil side of him. I was never at any time in any way exposed to that, so it's still hard to reconcile. The devil does go around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I think at first I felt very sad, very, very disappointed in him. Obviously I felt, you know, tr terribly sad for the victim because there's no doubt about it. My father's, father's violated him and, you know, done irreparable damage to his life. What a God I am this morning. I thought it was my moral duty to face up to it with my own father which, you know, hopefully anyone who's even slightly human can think about that part of it, you know, that I had to confront my own father, my hero. We didn't cover it up. We did tell people straight away. We did make, take his credential off him. He never did preach again. And uh, we did oversee and ensure that he was never put in a position to be close to kids to be able to do that again. What we didn't do is report it to the police. And of course it's come out since then, there are others as well. And I don't think we, I don't think we to this day know the full extent of it. I, I don't know the full extent of it. I think I would be aware of, it, of about six, but listen, I have no idea. It could be much bigger than that, I just don't know. Why didn't, at that stage, you go to the police? Rightly or wrongly, I genuinely believed that uh, I would be preempting the the uh, victim if I were to just call the police uh, at that point. Well, when he came forward, he was 36 or 37 years old, and he was very adamant. Uh, he didn't want to, you know, to involve the police. He didn't want the church authorities involved or the police authorities involved. And so he was brittle. And I think that, um, you know, because of that, uh, I didn't see the police as an option. If you're talking about defending my father, I don't, what he did was undefendable. It's painful, it's been painful for 15 years. With the Royal Commission and with the media and so on, I get very upset that the focus is on my dad because it's as if he is paying the consequences for another man's actions and I think that's extremely unfair. Slowly but surely I started drifting into becoming more isolated. I was slowly imploding inwardly. I knew behind the scenes that he was really struggling like you know he was like an insomniac he couldn't sleep and I knew that that was taking a physical toll on him. I got to the point where I was taking sleep tablets every night of my life. So I was basically dependent on them. And, uh, and with that, I think, they mixed, I think they messed with my emotions. And I would say that I got to the point where I was fundamentally depressed. Kind of came to that whole sort of um, 
you know, crescendo moment where he had, you know, a panic attack. I I knew he was in trouble that night. I just thought I was dying. I'm going, Bobby, I'm dying. I'm dying. I can't breathe. The end result was that I was um, diagnosed with having post-traumatic stress syndrome. And to be honest, it made sense to me. Preparation for Sunday 